Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 60th episode of the IWFM webinar series, Navigating Turbulent Times. I really do not know where time's gone. We're now on our 60th episode, and as many of our previous episodes, we're trying to tackle areas that relate to workplace and facilities managers. So as you can see on the screen there, we've got probably one of the longest titles of our webinar series, so that, that gets this award today. But we're going to be looking at the, a very important theme that's coming out, particularly for workplace and facilities management, about smart buildings and particularly around uh, video security and how that world's uh, changed in particular in the role of tech in terms of intruder alarms, environmental sensors and access control. And at this point, I want to say a massive thank you for, for Carter for uh, being our partner on today's webinar. And we have two um, esteemed colleagues from Ficada that will be talking you through today's episode. So if we just move on. Um, Introducing myself, um, many of you uh, may be new to our episodes uh, today or frequent listener viewers. I'm going to be your host today, Peter Brown, Head of Research and Insight at IWFM, and I appreciate many of you have seen me on previous episodes, as mentioned. Um, and we do have a stellar lineup of people today uh, to talk you through the subject matter. So we've got some uh, presentations today. It's going to be a presentation format from Jace Luke, and also we're joined by Matt, who's going to be hosting the Q&A section. So at this point, I would encourage audience to send in Q&As. This session is recorded and um, will be cascaded afterwards. So as I'm proving, this is live. So um, thank you for joining today. So you can see our panel on the screens there, and I'm just going to go across as we see. Um, really for the panel just to introduce themselves to let you know audience who you're hearing from today and I want to get as quick, as quick into the content as soon as possible. So if I firstly go to Jace Keane who's Director of Global Securities Operations Citrix. So uh, Jace if you could just introduce yourself to the audience that'd be great. Thanks Pete. Uh, good uh, afternoon everybody. Um, as Pete said Jason Keane on the uh, one security operations Citrix. Uh, Citrix is a tech company, um, and I cover everything non-cyber, um, so it's people, sites, and operations um, for the company. I've been in for four years. Before that, I was in the pharma sector for four years, and before that, I was uh, uh, in, the, in the British Army doing pretty much the same thing, um, and that's me. No, thanks, Jason. Just to let the audience that um, Jace isn't being shy today. We've had a few issues with his camera, so uh, he won't be on camera today, just in case anyone's picked up on that already. So moving along, thank you, Jace, for that. And we will hear later from Citrix as a, as a customer of Fagadas later um, in terms of how, how that's worked for Citrix. So we've got Luke Smith, as mentioned, uh, from Fagada that's going kind to of solutions engineer. So good afternoon, Luke afternoon and hello everyone on the on the session nice to meet everyone I, i'm luke one of our uk solutions engineers at bacada so i've been here for for two two years now and involved in in the vast majority and a huge amount of our of our projects over that time so i'll be taking you through um effectively the smart building session having a look at how we can start modernizing some of those items and and really start looking at physical security in perhaps a different light when we start looking at some of the functionality so looking forward to, to getting stuck in and jumping in into that that's great. And you'll be hearing very shortly from Luke that I've been promised it's a very interactive uh, um, presentation he's got today to get you involved in terms of uh, the art of the possible. So uh, looking forward to that, Luke. But last but not least, we've got Matt Antos Lewis, Amir Marketing Lead at Fagada. So good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Peter. Very kind. Hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as Peter said, my name is Matt. Uh, just like Luke, being here just under two years now from the very birth of Ficada's Amir office. Uh, obviously, we were founded uh, based in San Francisco, and I lead the marketing team here. So working with the likes of Jason and Luke in telling our customer stories, and as Peter so uh, eloquently put it, uh, showing the rest of you what the art of the possible is. That's great. And thank you, Matt. So we'll be seeing Matt later, who will be hosting our Q&A section. So please send in your questions as we go along, uh, audience, again, to make that session as interactive. We would love to hear your feedback. So um, as promised, it is being recorded, this session. So please cascade to clients, customers, colleagues afterwards. But let's get into the content as promised as quick as possible. And this is where I hand over to Luke to talk you through uh, the first aspect of today's webinar. So 
So the floor's yours, Luke. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, we're going to start with, I'll start with a couple of slides just to give a, a bit of a backdrop and I want to make this as interactive as possible. So we're going to jump across actually into one of our demonstration environments so that you can see some of the, the devices in action. But there's a really good starting point and a good segue for that. One of the, the key things that we want to cover, and we'll cover this piece of functionality a little bit later during the session itself. But one of the nice things when we're looking at video security, and one of the most common tasks that you probably potentially are, are likely to be involved in is the sharing of footage outside something's happened, an incident's happened at a particular location, and you need to share that footage. One of the really nice pieces that we have around this is the ability to send a live link directly to a camera feed itself. So we want to make sure that you have a chance to actually see this in action. So there's a couple of numbers on screen for this, and my colleague Matt is going to pop this into the chat as well. Definitely worth popping that in, sending a, a quick uh, email address to that number that you've got there, and you'll receive a link back through to one of our cameras. It will be for one of our cameras in the, the US, so it might be quite early in the morning, but that link will give you access so that you can come in later during the day and see them waking up in the morning, see the lovely weather that I'm sure they always have on the, the west coast of the US there, and just see that piece of functionality in action as well. But to start off with just a little bit about who we are and effectively what we're going to be covering during this session. So when we're looking at physical security, when we're looking at smart buildings, there's kind of a, a core set of products that you're most likely familiar with in that space. You've obviously got your video security, which is your CCTV. You've got your access control. So who's going to be allowed into the space or who's not going to be allowed into the space. You've got your intrusion alarm system and then potentially you're doing some form of environmental monitoring as well. So looking and keeping an eye on things like temperature and humidity. Now, those product lines caught from the, the core part of the Vicada offering when we look at physical security. But when we start looking a little bit about the architecture of how we deploy these systems, this is where we really differ and we start looking at things called a hybrid cloud architecture compared to the typical on-prem structure that you might be familiar with. And we'll have a look at some of the challenges about how these things have been done so far. And then we'll look at some of the benefits you have when you start moving to a more hybrid cloud model. But a little bit about Vicada so that you know who we are. We have a founding team from Stanford and MIT and we have a very simple goal as our organization to create a modern enterprise physical security system. So really the all up vision is building a secure, scalable platform, which is ready for AI applications. And really that's just a fancy way of saying being able to have use cases, being able to make your physical security do things that perhaps previously hasn't been possible before. Perhaps there's crowding in a certain location and you want to be notified that there's more than five people in a certain space. Or perhaps you want to do a search based on someone's face to see their whereabouts across the entirety of your estate. It's very easy to do with some of the more intelligent features and functionality of the platform as a whole as well. So to start off with, when we're looking at traditional video security, there's three words that summarize this exceptionally well. It's very bulky, it's very expensive, and it's very hard to maintain. And generally, the reason for that is that on the diagram on the right side, it summarizes this really, really, really nicely. You've got your cameras, you've got that centralized MVR or DVR, which is going to have that storage element. There's going to be an underlying operating system that's going to be sitting on that device. And on the far left, right side, you've got that monitor and that local PC. So that's how you're going to be actually interacting with the system. Now, the biggest challenge with this approach is that you've got that MVR or DVR in the center. And for one, that's a single point of failure. If something happens to that device, you potentially lost the CCTV footage from a huge number of cameras. And of course, that's absolutely less than ideal. Equally as well, there's a lot of different components that you have to think about with this setup. You've got to think about this firmware that's running on the cameras. You've got to think about patching and managing that MVR in the center. And to actually access the system, you probably need a dedicated client application that you're going to need to pre-install. You're going to need to keep it up to date. So there's just a lot of things that you need to manage on an ongoing basis. And that makes things like scalability really, really, really hard. Now, of course, when we look at this from a multiple site deployment, though, or when we're looking at it from remote access, and by remote access means perhaps you're not physically on the site, but you still need to access these systems. There's a couple of different approaches that are done with this. Either one, you simply have no remote access into your video security system. You physically have to go to your sites. You have to go armed with your USB stick, plug into that MVR or DVR to pull the footage off. And it's just a very long, convoluted process for that to be able to do that. Or alternatively, you might have that remote access, but you might need to pre-connect pre to a VPN, you might need to do some additional steps. And what most likely happens there is that from a networking side with the IT teams, they're potentially opening up a huge amount of holes in their firewall in order to facilitate that remote connectivity. So a lot of different challenges that come on that side when we're looking at scalability, simplicity, and just the overall management complexity that comes with the traditional approach to video security. Now, when we look at access control, it's actually a very similar story, even though it's a very different 
function compared to the video security. When you're looking at access control traditionally, it is again another system that's very complicated, it's very hard to install, and it's very difficult to scale. You've got your on-prem door controllers, which are in the center there. You've got your PC on the far right side, which is running your access control software. Again, that's going to have an underlying operating system, and that's going to store all of your access control configurations. Now with access control, again, when we're looking at remote or multiple site deployments, there's a couple of different circumstances there. In the kind of the worst case, the scenarios where you might potentially have completely disparate access control systems at each site. So you as a user might be sitting in three or four different access control systems and even potentially have three or four different access cards that you might need to use depending on which building that you want to go to. Alternatively, it comes back to that network side of things where again, your IT teams are gonna to have to set up the network to facilitate that remote connectivity between these sites. And again, when we're looking at scalability, it just makes a lot of extra headaches and things that you need to think about and worry about in order to get that to function. So kind of what's the solution to that and what's the obviously the, the new architecture or the new way of doing that is what we call a hybrid cloud approach. So effectively what we mean when we're talking about that hybrid approach is having the reliability of solid state storage, but combining that with the accessibility of the cloud. And we'll start off with on the CCTV side effectively what that means. The first part of that is that you strip away the need for any on-prem infrastructure outside of the physical device itself. So you can say goodbye to that MVR or DVR, you can get rid of that, you don't need to worry about that anymore. And you're actually moving the storage directly onto the device itself. So in this case, onto the camera. Now across the Vicada portfolio is a nice example. One of the nice things is, is that we provide up to 365 days of retention directly on that device itself. So even if you have very strict data retention requirements, we have a, a, an option that will be suitable for that as well. And this is 24 seven recording as well. So what's really nice about the storage side of things is that you no longer need to get on the, the maths hat and figure out I've got 20 cameras, I need 30 days of retention, therefore I need X amount of terabytes on my MVR or DVR in order to facilitate that. And then a week later, your manager comes to you and say, actually, we need 10 more cameras and your original storage calculation goes out the window. We keep it super simple. If you need 30 days of footage, you get a 30 day camera. If you need 60 days, you get a 60 day camera and that's 24 seven recording. Of course, a lot of people might be thinking, well, video data is really big. How is this gonna be impactful from a, from a bandwidth point of view? And the nice thing with our platform is that we keep our bandwidth to a steady state of around five to 20 kilobits per second per camera. So that is an exceptionally small amount, which means that even if you have a huge amount of cameras at a particular location, you're not gonna find yourself completely saturating your one lengths. And then finally, the most critical part, how on earth are you accessing all of this? Well, everything we do is done through the command platform. Now, what that is, is that it's a completely web-based application. Of course, being completely web-based, all you need is access to a web browser. And most of the time nowadays, you're not too far away from one of those. But to take that a step further, we also do have our dedicated iOS and Android application. So now you can start getting access to these systems directly from your mobile device as well, which is nice. When we start looking at the security from a logging point of view, when you start combining that with things like single sign-on integration and multi-factor authentication, it just means that you're protecting and have full visibility about who's accessing the platform, and it gives you that flexibility to do that from no matter where you are as well. And again, it's very similar on the access control side of things as well. So we strip away the need for that on-prem access control server, and we just require that door controller itself. So you no need to worry about servers, no need to worry about those databases or those on-prem compliance. You just need the door controller itself, and that makes scalability incredibly easy to do. And of course, again, it's all accessed through the same platform. And one of the nice things we'll start seeing is when we have these different product lines and different products integrated together, it gives you some really interesting insights that are available as part of that as well. So to kind of summarize all of that and put that into a nice kind of summary slide effectively here, you've got these various events coming from these different systems that are all coming back to that centralized cloud, and you're accessing that from a single web-based device through the command web application. So really easy from a deployment point of view. And then the, finally, of course, one of the things we briefly touched on there was around things like environmental monitoring, getting a good idea about the environmental quality at certain spaces. Now, there's three things I want to highlight here before we jump into actually what these sensor readings are. The first one is that when you think about sensors, you might be familiar with sensors that just are going to give you a reading. You know, it's going to tell you what the temperature is at different periods of time. Now, that is, of course, helpful information, but it's really helpful and really powerful when you can start having that natively integrated with the camera system as well. So instead of just having your temperature is 
35 degrees, you can physically see what might be causing an increase in that threshold. Or perhaps there's an increase in the noise level and suddenly there was, or the noise is reading at 140 decibels. You can now with the native video integration physically see what might be causing such a dramatic increase in the noise quality there as well. And when we're looking at physical security, obviously proactivity is really, really, really important. These systems are things that have been very much reactive. Something's happened, you're gonna come back in and review that. We wanna make sure that we have a whole host of proactive features across the platform, whether that's telling you that there's a certain person that you've set up as a person of interest has been detected at your site, or perhaps there's someone trying to force their way through your door on our access control system, we can give you those early warnings of those activities so that you can respond much quicker as well. And of course, the beauty of all of this is that because it is cloud managed, it's secure, it makes remote monitoring incredibly easy from any device or browser, and it makes it incredibly easy to deploy as well. Now, just a quick summary of what effectively we're looking at or talking about when we're looking at environmental monitoring. A lot of these are relatively straightforward, temperature, humidity, vaping, smoking, motion and noise, all straightforward. Those that you might not be familiar with are around things like AQI, which is Air Quality Index, TVOX, Total Volatile Organic Compounds, and PM 2.5, Particulate Matter 2.5. Now, I'll keep it relatively high level for this session, but they're all related to air quality in some form or another, and heightened levels of any one of those can have potential detrimental impacts on people's health. So lots of different interesting readings. And the nice thing about this particular device itself, our environmental sensor, is that it's an all-in-one sensor. So you get access to all of these environmental readings on a single device as well. Of course, that's enough of me talking to some slides. Let's actually jump across into the platform and see all of this stuff in action. So like I said, completely web-based portal. So all I need to do is switch across to this tab where I've got the Vicada command tab open there. Now we'll start off with the CCTV side, but of course you can see all of the different products at the top here. So depending on what I'm interested in accessing, I can switch between them incredibly easily. I can switch across to our access control, I can switch across to our environmental sensors, or I can switch across to our intrusion alarms as well. So I'll take these sequentially during this session, we'll go through one by one and we'll take a look at some of the mainstay features of all of these. But one of the big things you'll start to notice as we do jump across those product lines is that it's so nice to have this natively integrated so that when we see the access control in a moment that you've got camera footage for each of those access events as well. But let's start with the camera side as, as a starting point. So we have cameras deployed across the vast majority of, of the world here. You can see that I've got cameras in the, the London, I've got cameras down here in uh, sunny, sunny Sydney in Australia, and then we've got them on both sides of the United States here as well. Now, this is one of my favorite views because when we think about traditional video security, one of the big challenges is having visibility about how healthy the entirety of your camera state is. And we hear horror stories all the time of things that have happened, you go to the camera, you try and get the footage from it, and then at that point you discover that it's been offline for three months. You know, it's probably the worst time to figure that out. It's a bit like figuring out that your car brakes don't work when you're approaching a traffic light and really, 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 really need to stop. So having this visibility over the entirety of your camera state is incredibly helpful. I can see immediately that on our United States cameras that they're all green, they're all healthy, they're all up, they're all operational, which makes it really easy. And I can start to drill down into this as well, and I can start to see what exactly is causing this as well, so I can click through. But let's actually go through onto our floor plan and have a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the functionality on there as well. Now, what's really nice about this is that it's a really nice visual way to see the camera states that I've got. I can click onto any one of these cameras and I can pull up the live feed that corresponds to with that as well. But you also might notice this page on or this little bar on the left side. That is our live motion plotting coming into play. Now, it is super early in the US, so I would be super surprised if we did see some life at the moment. But to show you what that looks like, let's look at that from a historical perspective. So let's actually drop that down from this, this icon here. Let's click on people heat map, and we can look at this from a historical point of view as well. Now, let's pop that back to yesterday. And let's say I'm interested to see all of the activity yesterday at, let's pick 7.30 in the evening, for example. Effectively, what this has done now is that it's now given me a really nice view about where the level of activity is across my location. The darker the shaded green, the higher the level of activity in that space. So you can see here, and you can probably very quickly deduce, this section down here is our main entrance. Of course, that's got the highest level of activity. We do have a side entrance up here in the top left portion here as well. And this is a stairwell up to this section. And then actually on the right side, we do have another entrance. But as you can see, it's actually not being used as much and during this section. So this is really helpful functionality. And this is some of our analytics coming into play to give you a really nice insight and visibility into how your spaces are being utilized. Which areas are the most busy? Which ones have got the highest levels of congregation? 
But what we can also do is we can jump straight through onto the camera feed. And because this is completely web-based, I'm sitting here in London. This is a camera that's currently deployed over in our HQ location. And I can very quickly and easily see the live camera feed that we've got here. Looks like a very windy day over in the United States at the moment there though. But as I start to scroll down, one of the nice things that we do is that I've got a thumbnail view over a 24 hour period of all of that footage from that camera. So instead of me having to sit here for a huge amount of time trying to do footage review, I can very quickly and easily scroll back through. And as you'll start to notice, it basically does a high speed scroll across that period of time. Now, in this particular circumstance, you can see that that individual there on the left side of this thumbnail, he's outlined in a nice green bounty box. That's, of course, telling me that that is a person. You can also see at the very bottom here where it says the number one just on this bar here. That's telling me, as you can probably imagine, that there is one person here. Or perhaps in this case, there's three people here. You can see one, two, and then the third person by the bike right there. So again, this is some of our analytics coming into play. And when you think about footage review, when you start thinking about footage one of the big challenges you might have is that you might simply at the moment have to sit there for three hours and watch the footage. Someone gives you a time frame, they say between two and six is when this incident happened. And unfortunately for you, you have to sit there. Maybe you put it on five times the speed, but the chances are you still spent 45 minutes of your lunch break trying to view and scrub through that footage. We can also take that a step further and start using some of these analytics to do intelligent searches. So I'm going to tell the system, show me all of the motion that's happened on this door, and it's going to go through and pull back all of that motion. Now, the challenge with relatively primitive motion systems is that if this wasn't caused by a person, you know, you can see it's a particularly windy day. We have these very large, I think they're yuccas, maybe not yuccas, very large plants on either side of the door. They're swaying in the wind. A relatively primitive motion system will just pick that up and say that's motion. Therefore, I'm going to show you about it. But of course, when we're looking at being proactive with this, if you start getting a huge amount of motion alerts, what are you going to do? You're going to set up an email filter. It's going to go into an email folder and you're never going to look at them again. Defeats the point of them. So we can start being a little bit more intelligent with that and start using some of those analytics. So I actually say, I'm only interested in the motion caused by a person. So I can filter that down here. And instead of showing me all of that motion, I'm now going to get the motion caused by a person. I can then click through onto that. I can pull up the corresponding historical footage and I can see what was happening at that particular point in time. So instead of me having to sit there through a three hour period, I can select the area of the camera feed that I'm interested in. I can play that back and I can see that this person was coming in with his scooter on that historical footage nice and quickly as well. But what you also might be noticing is that we have some really interesting things when it comes to our more advanced analytics with our facial search. Now let's say all I know is that yesterday someone ran off with someone's handbag. Because they were running away, I could only see the back of their head. All I knew is that they were wearing a red top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the system, actually, I want to see all of the people that were wearing a red top, for example. So I'm going to click on other potty. I'm going to click on red. And it's going to go through and it's going to search for all of the times that a person wearing a red top was seen across the platform. So in this case, it's pulling back some people from today that have already been seen wearing a red jacket. And it's going to go back and look at that historically as well. So really, really, really handy. I can do searches based on the level of information that I do have. I can take that a step further. I can say I'm also interested in people wearing a wearing a backpack, depending on the lower body color. So what trouser color are they wearing as well? But you can see here it's pulled back very quickly all of the different people wearing a red top as well. You might also notice if you've got a keen eye, there's this facial bar that's appeared at the top section here. These are all the detected faces specifically on this camera itself. It's going to put them into chronological order for me. And what I can do is I can click onto one of those faces. It's going to pull up that particular person and it's going to go back and search for all of the times that that particular individual was seen at that particular point in time as well. So really easy for me to be able to go back and see. And this guy, for example, was coming out with his lunch by the looks of things at different times across different days. Now, what's really powerful, though, is, of course, that's just a single camera. But imagine you've got a huge camera estate. We can also take that a step further. One of our co-founder, Hans Robertson, if you might have heard of him previously, I can click onto his profile in our platform, and I can now search for him across the entirety of our camera estate. You notice here I've got the name of the camera, so we saw him today on the front entrance. We saw him back in September on the stairwell entrance. It's very easy for me to pick a profile, and I can see exactly where that person has been across the entirety of my camera estate. If Hans decides to get on a transatlantic flight tomorrow, for example, I can pick him up, I can search for him, he will be detected by the camera system. What well, you might also notice that there's a little bell icon here. Now, what that bell icon is, is that that's setting up that person as a person of interest. So I can now take that a step further and start making that more proactive. A person of interest is someone basically that I've told the system, if you see this person going forward, I want to know about it. So in this case, for example, we set up a person of interest for Johnny using this particular face. And you can see I've filtered all of these person of interest events so that all I can see all of the times that this individual has been seen. 
Of course, if he was to be seen in five minutes going back into the main entrance, I would get either an email or SMS notification for that. And you can see he's just at the back there coming through that door. I can then set up to be proactive. So I'll get notified off the back of that as well. So that from a security point of view, if there's someone who perhaps gets has been banned from your locations, or perhaps you just need to really quickly search for someone, using these analytics is incredibly helpful, incredibly powerful to be able to do that with as well. Now, of course, I want to make sure that we have enough time to jump across the access control as well. So one of the really nice things you'll see on that side is that we have the cameras integrated with the actual door itself. So if we pick our front door, for example, I can click through onto the front door itself and I can see all of the different access events for that particular door. I can scroll back through, I can see who it was, I can see how they got access, so whether they're using a key card. One of the really nice things that we have with our platform is that we have a mobile application with our access control. So you can start allowing people to use their mobile devices to get access to your physical spaces as well. Physical access cards, nightmare to manage. People lose them, people give them to other people, they break them, they take a huge amount of time to administer, to replace. Being able to use people's physical mobile devices is really powerful because one, they have it with them all the time. And two, they generally look after their mobile phones a little bit better. There's always that person who always seems to permanently have a smashed phone screen, but generally people will look after their phones a little bit more. And it just gives them a frictionless way to get access to your physical spaces. But of course, for all of these access events, I can click onto that event. I can see who it was. I can see how they got in. But most crucially, I can also go back, look and look at the historical footage for that. So you can see here, he pulled his phone out, touched it to the reader, and he's got access with that scooter as well. So not only can I see that that person got access, but I can also see effectively what happened with that camera footage associated. Now, one of the really nice things that we do have the ability to do as well is that we have a whole host of different event types for this. So door held open is obviously a really incredible one. This is our front door. If someone decides to leave our front door open, it's going to be a potential security risk. So therefore, I really want to have visibility of all of those different event types. Of course, most crucially, if someone's trying to force their way through their door, so person with a crowbar sort of style, I can get those events via door forced open events. I'm hoping we don't have any for our front door, but it's a really nice way to double check. And it looks like there isn't, thankfully. But of course, it's nice to have that visibility of that as well. And what's really powerful with this is that you can get these event types through via email and SMS as well. So coming back to that proactive piece, it's being able to tell you that your front door is open, your IT room's open with all of your expensive equipment. It's giving you that early warning that something's happened. Now, equally as well, one of the really powerful things is that you might not always physically be at the site that you're kind of effectively trying to integrate with or operate. So what I can do is I can click onto this particular door, for example, and I can see in this case, I've actually got two camera feeds associated with that. Now, let's say someone's stuck outside, perhaps they are trying to get in. What I've done there is that I can click on this padlock icon that will go through, that will do an unlock of the door, and I can see that that's associated with that as well. So that's what that red padlock icon allows me to do. So if someone was stuck outside, for example, or they couldn't get in, or you know they left their car outside, I can physically see with the cameras associated with them. And if I needed to, I can do a remote unlock of that door as well, very, 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 very easily, just by pressing that padlock icon too. So super easy to be able to unlock that from the system. Again, I'm sitting here in London. This is over in our, our HQ location. So even though I'm not physically there, I still have that ability to do that as well. Now, of course, one of the really nice things is that if we pick one of our side entrances, so if we pick railroad exterior, for example. Now, one of the nice things that we have here is that you've seen that we are intelligent enough to know the amount of people that have been detected on the camera feed. Now, what's really nice is that because we've got this natively integrated with our access control, we know from the camera that there was X amount of people that were detected on a camera feed, and perhaps only one person badged in, but three people went through the door. It's obviously such a common security problem. People are friendly, people hold the door open for people, but of course it's a potential security risk because someone could follow someone in and get access to your space. So with tailgating, with the associated camera, it knows how many people are in the scene. It knows how many badge in events there were. So in this case, on this particular door, for example, a tailgating event was detected. We can see that one person badged in. Quite clearly, there's two people there going through that door. And that triggered, consequently, a tailgating event off the back of that. Again, because the camera knows that two people were in that scene, but only David was the one that was actually badging in, it's triggered a tailgating event in that section as well. So really powerful functionality on that side too. But of course, the really nice thing with this is that, again, for all of these events, I've got that camera footage there. I can use it. I can see it. It's really, really powerful to have that natively integrated together so that I have that full visibility as well. Coming across the environmental sensors, of course, environmental monitoring is incredibly important. And like I said, one of the nice things with this is that having the camera feed associated with that, I can physically see all of the different sensor readings at a particular point. 
So this is the sensor itself. They're all the readings that we covered during the slide deck. I've got the camera feed at the top there, which is going to give me a live real-time look at effects from that area or that camera associated with that. But down here, I've actually got a nice historical graph view of all of those different sensor readings. I can see all of the different temperature. Apologies, this is in Fahrenheit, because again, this is in our HQ location. But I can see all of the times the noise level. I can get a nice historical graph of that as well. I can get a nice running average over, say, the last seven days for this. What's really powerful is that this sensor will provide these sensor readings for 365 days, so you can have up to a year's worth of sensor data without having to think about the long term storage of that, which is nice, so that you can have a really nice look at the averages over those times as well. But of course, one of the really powerful things coming back to the proactive alerting side of things is being able to say, actually, for the temperature, this is in my server room, for example, I want to be notified if it ever deviates from this high threshold or this low threshold, so if it gets too hot or if it gets too cold. I would like to be notified about that myself, Luke Smith, and I would like to be notified by email or SMS over these different time periods as well. So again, it's going to give me that early warning that any one of these sensor readings has been detected and I can go through and detect that as well. So really nice to get those early warnings of things. But of course, when those alerts do get triggered, I can always click onto that event and I, up at the top here, it's going to correspond that with the camera footage and I can physically see what was causing it at that time as well. I can also go through and click on that on the graph view and see that there was an alert trigger at that point in time as well. And then finally, the final piece of the puzzle is around our alarms product as well. So alarms is our intrusion alarm offering. Now, we've obviously seen that the camera knows when motion is had detected. It can detect people. We can see that our access control is intelligent enough to know whether the door's held open, whether the door's been forced to open. And we've also seen our environmental monitor, which has things like motion detection on it as well. Now, what's really nice with our intrusion offering is that, of course, you've got your typical wired sensors when it comes to an intrusion system. Things like break glass sensors, things like door contact sensors. But what's really powerful is that you can have the other Vakata devices natively integrated into this as well, so that you can use that camera as a motion trigger for your alarm system. You can use that access control system for an, kind of a, an event trigger for the alarm system as well. So if someone is trying to force their way through your door and your site is in an alarm state, it's going to trigger that alarm. Or if your environmental sensor picks up motion, it can do that as well. So you've got a whole host of different options here. But of course, the really nice thing about this is that when we look at things like our alarm console, I can very easily see and do two-way audio and two-way communication with that private section here. But what's really nice is that I can go back through, I can look historically and see actually, in this case, an alarm was raised two days ago. I can see that it was caused by the IDF sensor, so it detected a person, but also that pop-up box that's appeared in combination with that sensor picking up motion, also all of the cameras associated with that site also picked up a person as well. So you can see that the motion event was picked up there. I can see that it was resolved after a time period. It was resolved by Rob Conwell. I can see that there was a verification event. So as part of the alarm offering is that monitoring component. So one of someone from our monitoring team will verify whether it is an active incident or not. So is it actually a person? Are they actively trying to break in, for example? They're going to decide whether there's a visible threat or not and decide to trigger or you know, disarm the site. And if so, they're going to go through and contact the people necessary for that as well. But in this case, it was resolved by Rob. He determined that it was a false alarm, it wasn't required, and it shows me there and it goes back into that arm state as well. So really, really handy to have that all natively integrated with the alarms, because again, you've seen all of the additional analytics on the camera side. You can see how powerful it is to have things like those facial analytics to be able to detect there's motion there. And all of it comes really nicely together to cover your core physical security requirements under a single platform, under a single umbrella, that of course is completely web-based. What's really nice about the entirety of our portfolio is that all of the hardware, one, comes with a 10-year warranty. Of course, people get stuck, people get confused. There's always help available within the platform during this bottom section that you've got down here as well, which is nice. It's a really easy platform to be able to use. And of course, like I mentioned, you can also use this as part of the iOS and Android applications so that you can roll out of bed in the morning. There's not security instance. Someone says there's motion. You can quickly pull it up on your phone. You can pull up the camera feed at that particular space. So you can see, okay, this is actually someone trying to get in or I can respond to that. I don't physically have to be restricted any further to a dedicated client device that's going to be used for accessing this. I can access this from no matter where I am. And of course, when it comes back to that core physical security, it's nice to have all of this under one umbrella with all of that camera footage integrated nicely together for all of that as well. So that effectively brings me up to time on the, on the presentation section. So what I'm going to do is going to pass across back for, for the next section of the, the session. But hopefully that's been helpful. Hopefully that's, that's been great. And as uh, mentioned, do pop some questions as you've been thinking as we go through into that Q&A and we'll get onto those at the bottom of the end as well.
No, thank you, Luke. Um, I have to say it's come a long way in terms of (laughs) the tech and how it supports. And thank you for going through that in terms of actually seeing the interactivity of the software, how that applies to people's issues about cameras, access control. And as I said earlier, really showing the possibilities that are currently out there with with, uh, particularly software such as yourselves about will address, I'm sure, some of our audience concerns that have joined joined today's webinar, I'm sure, for some of the reasons you've shared there um, about the issues of security and, and really how this could support individuals with some of the issues they're facing on a day-to-day basis. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for those audience members that have sent questions through. We have got a couple and please be patient with us. We will get to them as promised uh, under Matt's guidance as host as part of that section. Um, so just keep firing your questions through. Another one's just come flying through. So I want to get to that as soon as possible. But before we do, we've heard from Fakada there in terms of uh, the areas of cameras, access control, just to name the two areas Luke went through through in great detail. But I think it's as important to hear from a customer stroke client um, of their experience today. Uh, And we've got Jace, who I introduced earlier, really to talk about Citrix's um, challenges and how how they have evolved with the support of Fakada. So Jace, I'll I'll hand over to you to go through your presentation entitled Citrix Building Security Concept of Ops. So Jace, over to you. Thanks, Pete. Um, so just to put Citrix in, in context, um, we're about 10,000 people. Um, we're a tech company. We've got lots of pre-patent IP. We have engineering sites. That's got a a huge, a a large density of that. We've got sales sites and we've got support sites. Um, we're, we're, we're spread globally. We've got a large concentration in the U S between the West coast and the East coast. Um, We've got concentrations in most European capital cities. Uh, we've got a large concentration in Bangalore and in India, and another one in Nanjing and China, um, and sales offices, sales offices globally. So when, when I came on board with Citrix uh, four and a bit years ago, we had uh, an in-place access control system that was kind of global. Uh, but we didn't have a single global um, surveillance system, CCTV system. Um, And so um, well above my pay band, it was decided that we would start to use Vicada, um, which um, has has been like an absolute breath of fresh air for us, uh, which I'll come on to later. I won't steal all my sweets or go off uh, um, kind of, go away from the, the order of what I wanted to present things. Um, so can I have the next slide, please listen. With any, um, for those of you working in the tech sector or any kind of ideas sector really, um, that's got a lot, large amount of, of pre-patented, pre-copyright um, IP, um, we have to give we have to protect that. We have to keep our secrets secret, but we also have to give access to those who need it. Um, we had an in-place access control system, which um, we started to upgrade just before Bacada brought their offering out for access control. Um, hence the reason we haven't gone with the access control system. We spent um, a fairly large amount of money to upgrade it. And if I'd suggested moving to Bacarda, um, I wouldn't be speaking to you now because I'd be out of the job. Um, it is a very good offering, but it just didn't, we, we'd, we'd kind of gone with one at the time. So we've just taken the, um, the, the camera and the sensor offering right now. We have a, a GWC, a global watch center that provides all of our kind of tripwire to global events so um train crash in germany bombing in um wherever but also to our um to our systems both for access control and for uh, and for our surveillance systems they have the ability to to escalate and to respond through throughout through the through the rest of my team 
but also through um, local, um, local enablers at each site. Our legal department is so hot. Um, everything we do is um, legally compliant and ethical as well, um, as we have to be, but, I, but I'll touch on that in a little while with a case study. Um, when we look at our sites, we, we, we do employ defence in depth, um, uh, an interconnecting, interrelated network of, I can't remember the exact, uh, the exact description for multiple layers of defence. And we kind of def define our, um, our, our sites with, with four kind of key operational areas with an increasing security features going from the outside in with decreasing access. And so if I can have the next slide, Lucy, this will hopefully put it into a little bit of context. The, the public areas on the right in the purple, um, that is kind of our, our, outer, our outer cordon. The, not each site we have, not each site, not, not each data center, each code will necessarily have all areas, but most will have at least one, most likely two. So public areas um, where I kind of badge through the front door and then I'm into the into the public area. The we allow visitors into those areas most readily. It's things like the dining room, the outer areas, the reception, loading docks, that kind of thing. We'll always have access control on that door you can see on, on the right hand side. And we would always put a camera onto that. Any, any doors we have access control would have cameras on, any fire escapes, and I'll deal a little bit with the other areas, but based on the outer perimeter, doors, fire escapes, key points, generally. Um, within that, in the mid protection area, we've kind of got two areas. We've got a Citrix working area. These are the areas where perhaps sales might be discussed, um, clients might be discussed, um, um, our, our competitors might be discussed, pricing models and that kind of thing, which, which needs a far higher degree of protection than in the public areas where we've got more visitors. In the working areas, we would um, limit, um, limit visitor access, reduce visitor access. Within the mid-protection area, although, although I was wrong, in the, in the, within the working area, we generally wouldn't have cameras. We generally wouldn't have any surveillance. We might have a barrier. You can see the the um, um, uh, the, the the door, which would have access control between the public area and into the working area. And so th that might have access control, and it and it would have a camera on it. But within the working area itself, we generally wouldn't have any any cameras. The specialised area is something that came out of. Um, um, a theft that we had, um, where we where we struggled to identify where the the um, the assailant had um, had been, and so in conjunction with legal, we um, we worked to to designate a specialised area, and within that specialised area, we would have a higher density of cameras, or in some cases sensors. And the sensors are an interesting one, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to those. So the, the, the specialised area, a higher degree of sensors, they'd be cited in conjunction with, with legal, um, and they would say, we would have to literally sing for our supper for each one, which, which really, really does work. And lastly, the red area, we would then have um, additional access control with multi-factor authentication, a, a tiger trap, a virtual tiger trap in some cases, um, and within the secure area, we would have near 360 degree coverage or as close as we could get within there, down each uh, hot and cold aisle within the DC, um, as best we can get 360 coverage, in addition to additional measures as well. So within the secure area, we, we, we generally don't have to argue with legal, they're quite, quite happy with that. But certainly within specialised areas, um, and the specialised area is probably one that's of most interest is those <clears throat> engineering spaces where there's a lot of a lot of pre-patent ip um we had one case in in uh, in china in nanjing where we 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 ran up a we, we ran up a plan 
um, for for additional camera deployments. Um, legal were were were, um, uh, were were good with it. The, the site leadership were initially good with it, and then we had a little bit of pushback from from the team. Um, we uh, one of the things that Matt didn't show you was the ability to uh, mask off. Oh, sorry, Luke didn't show you. Sorry, but the ability to uh, to mask off parts of the part of the image capture. We can we can mask of parts of uh, if it's looking at screens, if it's looking at particularly sensitive um, data that's being um, generated. So we can mask off those areas and and I'm sure Luke can can explain better than me, but it basically doesn't record those areas. It's not as though it's it's just a block. That 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 helped to uh, assuade, help to help to um, 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 encourage the team that, that and reassure them that we're not here to, to to spy on people. We're here to ensure the offices were safe. That worked to a degree, but in, in some cases we had to move the cameras, um, uh, which I'll come on to in a little while as, as to part of the joy for it. So the specialised areas are quite interesting. The, the the first the first site that we actually deployed um, was in Stockholm in Sweden, which was a fairly small office, 25-ish people. It had one entrance and it had one server room. And that was it. Um, so we sighted two cameras, um, and the, the install was done by a local vendor with facilities um, on site to help coordinate. Um, and the the link that Matt uh, that Luke sent around at the start um, was how we did the install. So we could I could send the contract to the link and the facilities manager the link. They could see where that camera's pointed, and we could ensure that it's pointed in the right direction. So for me to sit here in the UK and coordinate an install was was um, a, a, a little bit of an epiphany for us. And we've done most of our installs remotely as a result of that. Um, this, the sensors we've we've kind of found multiple uses for. Um, we've used them in um, in data centers uh, to uh, a backup with um, the additional environmental sensors that. That the teams might have, um, so that so that we can get a notification directly. As 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 Luke showed you on the on the demo, the um, when it's got a, a a range in which to alarm in, we can send that directly to the facility manager's phone directly, so that they can see when 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 that sensor is outside that range for whether it be um, sense uh, particles in the air, whether it be temperature, whether it be noise whether it be humidity. So they're, they're very useful in that respect. And certainly in one case in Greece, we had a sensor go down um, in a particularly sensitive room. We had a sensor in another room. We just unscrewed it out of the, where it was going, screwed it to where it was going into, activated the port, plugged the cable in. And then within six hours, we had a, a viable um, sensor option in that location. Um, other options we've looked at is um, private residences for our CEO. Uh, we had a call with the team this week to try and try and work out a way that we can best get coverage uh, to the CEO's house houses, sorry, um, and and also uh, to remote locations or locations perhaps into Regis offices or where we don't necessarily have a corporate network. Um, for anybody that asks about um, multi-factor authentication, um, we had a massive drive from our cyber team to get um, all kind of third-party um, applications pulled into Okta. Um, our system manager in Bangalore um, arranged a call with, with the cyber team and with one of uh, um, Luke's colleagues in the US, literally about five minutes to get that pulled into Okta. It was having looked at it for other applications, that took quite a lot of gnashing of teeth and sweat and things like this. This was unbelievably simple to do. Um, so certainly from a, from a multi-factor authentication point of view, it's very good. So why do we like it? And, and I've got several points written down. Firstly, it's, it's cost effective and it's scalable. Whether we are putting um, 150 cameras into a site in in India or two into Stockholm, um, that the process is just as simple. 
And as Luke said at the start, we don't have to think about server capacity. We don't have to think about uh, mountings. We don't have to think about illumination levels. We don't have to think about um, housings. It's literally all contained within the one pod. It's plugged into the network and then we're good to go. You don't have to be a CCTV expert to use this system. It helps that you, if you can plan surveillance, if you can, um, for those of you who are ex-military, to work up a STAB, surveillance and target acquisition plan, or you can work out where your vulnerable areas are, that helps, but you really don't have to be an expert. It, it, it's so easy to deploy. Um, we have, in some cases, used existing infrastructure, we've used existing cabling to rip out the old cameras and install new ones. Um, in some cases, we've done them ourselves. In some cases, we've got third-party contractors to come in and do them. Um, and indeed, the first one that we ever used, we had Velcroed to a wall, plugged into a network port as a proof of concept. And that was what kind of took it on from there. Um, the warranty, uh, Luke touched on it already, we got a 10-year warranty out of the near, uh, I think we've got about nearly 700 cameras deployed now globally. Um, I think we've had about two fail, um, and they were literally straight out of the box failure. Um, when we found that it doesn't work, we get in touch with the with the help desk. They send us a new one, and we send them a new. They send us a new one. We send them the old one back. It's it's that simple and that easy to do. They are maintenance free. As I said, we've had cameras in Stockholm for nearly three years now. We've not had to do anything with them. The cleaner goes around and. Gives the um, gives the objective lens a wipe, gives the outside a wipe every now and again to make sure there's no spiders growing across it, spiders webs growing across it. But that is absolutely it. All the patching's done automatically. Um, the the beauty of the platform, and Matt didn't really touch on it enough, I don't think. The, the the platform is so easy and so intuitive to use. One of the one of the best things about it is the fact that it's the what's new piece, and that just shows you kind of what's what is the latest thing that the, the, that the teams have thought of? Um, we do get pushed email as to what's new, but clearly very busy, don't necessarily take it in, but that's on the platform and, um, um, and, very, and, and really well done. And the, the, last, the last thing is, is the ability to get in touch with the team and say, can it do this? Can we do this? Um, we've come with a few suggestions and um, some of them have come, come to fruition. Some of them haven't. Um, so that's been very good. So if, if nothing else, the technology is breathtaking, highly cost effective at scale, and you don't have to consider maintenance beyond giving the the outside a wipe or perhaps giving them a clean when the window cleaner goes around. But that's it. If you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll answer them now. Oh, that's great, Jay. Thank you for that. Just to get the customer client perspective on what we heard from Luke in terms of how it's working for you. Um, I'm aware of time. Matt, I'm going to hand over to you. We've got a plethora of questions come through. And I guess Luke and Jay, respectively, if you can keep your short uh, answer short and concise, that'd be great. But obviously try and answer the question. That'd be wonderful. But Matt, I'll hand over to you just to take us through uh, particularly some of the questions from our audience. So that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. And I say, obviously, we've only got a few moments left. Uh, if anyone has any questions that we don't get to or that come up afterwards, please feel free to submit them via uh, Peter and the team and we'll we'll be more than happy to answer for you. Um, so cracking straight on. Um, first question from Jason. CCTV, is it stored on the camera and the cloud? Uh, what might be the security thoughts around the camera itself being stolen and someone accessing the data? Yeah, very it's a good question that one. So yeah, so by default, the, the footage will be on the, the camera itself. So for the for the retention period that we have now, as part of the, the offering, you do get 30 days of cloud backup included. Now that cloud backup is designed for those scenarios where you would like to have the footage stored both on the camera and in the cloud. So you've effectively got it in two places and incorporates that redundancy within to it. So in scenarios, like you said there, where security thoughts about the camera being stolen or someone accessing the, the data, 
The nice thing about it being stolen is, is for one, if you do have that cloud backup enabled, you've still got the data available. Secondly, when it, when it comes to stealing it, the cameras do have tamper detection built into them. So it will detect the movement in the camera itself and trigger a tamper alerts off the back of that. So coming back to that proactive side of things, when that does happen, it does immediately try and do a two, the backup of the last two minutes of footage. But what's really, really, really powerful is that when we think about that compared to an MDR slash DVR based approach, is eliminating that single point of failure by basically distributing that across a larger amount of cameras. And the last point about accessing the data, all of the data is encrypted at each point of the, the data's journey. So sitting on the camera itself, it's encrypted at rest. So if someone does get the, the camera itself, they're just going to have a, a paper weight on their hands at that point. Anything in transit we do use is TLS 1.2, and then anything stored in the cloud, we use AES 256 for that as well. So it's always encrypted and always secured, no matter at what point it is along that. Thanks, Luke. Next question from David. Uh, you mentioned that smartphones can be used for access control. Is this all smartphones, including iPhones, in the early days of this technology, Apple would not share security data? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so it, it does. It so there's uh, both an Android and iOS application available. So so it does include iPhones. We we've got people obviously at Vicada across our various offices that use their iPhone with our access control to get into our buildings. So yeah, that's that's perfectly perfectly usable, and you can use it across those devices should you wish. Okay, this question might be useful for both of you, both Luke from a technical standpoint and Jason from real world experience. Is the system scalable to high traffic estates, uh, thousands of persons at once? Yeah, do you want to take it first, Jace, around your experience, obviously, with the amount of cameras yeah, that you've got? We, not far off. We, we've got um, fairly high high traffic numbers, uh, around a thousand, one of our sites in Bangalore. Doesn't appear to be an issue there. Um, and we've got around 150 cameras at that site. Um, so certainly no issues for us in that regard. Fantastic. Yeah, and from a from more of a technical standpoint, one of the really nice things about our platform is that because you have stripped away that on-prem infrastructure, it's incredibly easy to be able to deploy additional cameras as you say, which all you need to do is pop the serial number on the bottom of the device into the command platform and it'll be ready for you to start making use of. It just needs to be patched into the network and you're, you're pretty much good to go after that. You don't need to think about having enough MVR or DVR ports. You don't need to think about having enough storage to be able to facilitate that. It's a system that scales incredibly well with you as you start growing, as you start adding more and more devices across your estates and it just makes it really easy to be able to do that as well. And of course, being able to access all of those at the same time. You've certainly seen some of those really interesting analytics during our demonstration itself and that's really nice when you do have a large amount of cameras because of course it just simply wouldn't be feasible for you to potentially do searches across such a huge amount a lot of these more intelligent analytics really come into handy for those scenarios thanks guys uh, next question it's great having multi-detection sensors sensors integrated with cameras but can you supply them without the cameras there are sensitivities around sighting of cameras to offices regarding data privacy for example uh, and it's no good simply telling people that the camera functionality is disabled. Absolutely. Yeah, so the, uh, they are two separate devices. You've got the camera and then you've got the sensor itself. So there, there's by no means a, a requirement to have the camera and the sensor. You can, of course, deploy the sensor just as it is, and then you'll get the sensor readings. You won't have the, the integrated camera view, but of course, that's coming from, from a separate device. So it's not built into the device, just to clarify and that it is two separate physical devices. But we have a very similar scenario in use cases that we certainly see a lot in the, the education space. Obviously, students, Vaping is a really big problem. They always go to the location and the spaces where they know that they can't be seen. And that, of course, is, is normally the bathrooms. So certainly one of the more common deployments we have is that we have a sensor on the inside of the bathroom because, of course, there's no recording elements to that. And then we have a camera covering the entryways or the corridors so that you have visibility about who's going in. Of course, someone goes in and then it suddenly triggers a vape alert on your sensor. You can probably very easily deduce that as well. So we certainly have that use case around potentially slightly more private areas, but there's nothing stopping you just plugging the sensor in that space. Thanks, Luke. Uh, next question is, how do we approach a deployment? Do you have different models for different use cases? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, so obviously we've got a, a whole host of products there around the, the physical security base. Sticking with the camera side of things, we have a whole host of different models around 
for, for different use cases. So whether that's our normal dome series, whether that's perhaps the, the bullet series, whether that's one of our fish eyes for a panoramic or 360 degree view. We have camera models that can be used in, in a, a huge amount of different scenarios for that, which is, which is really, 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 really nice. And effectively what that comes down to is that you have the ability to basically choose which camera is going to be most applicable for that. So lots of different options there. From an access control point of view, it's a lot more simpler. We have a door controller that will do, does four doors per door controller. And then it's a case of figuring out how many doors you have and then how many door controllers off the back. And then the sensor is just the single sensor device. But like we've seen, it is an all-in-one sensor. So you get all of those different sensor readings available for you. Cheers, Luke. Um, what sort of broadband speeds are required? And is there a 5G network backup option should the broadband go down? Yes, you yeah. can both handle that. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, certainly we have some some options there. So from a from a broadband speed point of view, we have very very limited. Uh, so our bandwidth in the steady state is like we said around twenty kilobits per per second. So effectively, one of the nice things about that is that we do keep the bandwidth as, as low as possible. We do have deployments that are on uh, backup options, so on a cellular backup, so that should that happen, there is gonna be that fallback. And we also have deployments that are using that cellular connection as the primary connection point, so in particularly remote locations as well. But certainly not sure if you wanna add any light onto that, Jason, around your experience around the bandwidth side of things. No, I, I, only that, it, that, it, that it's really quite low. Um, I couldn't tell exactly what we're drawing right now, but it, it, we don't I see a huge impact on the network. And gentlemen, I think I will come in at this point in terms of uh, questions. We've had a couple more through, but for the purposes of time, I think what we do is uh, respectively send those questions on to Luke, uh, Matt and Jace to, to respond back if that's okay. Um, again, there was a lot to go through today. I appreciate this episode probably could go on for another hour considering the questions coming through and, and some of the de debates. I think what you've certainly heard today through Ficada is, is, is what's possible and what's out there, yes, with their, their platform, but where people are looking at cameras, looking at how they do security, the traditional security, how that's changed with the role of tech. I think certainly demonstrated by Luke uh, today is exactly how that tech is now changing that landscape of security where it's not just simply a person behind a desk anymore you're looking at multiple sites real-time analytics real-time analysis um, which is very powerful for anyone I think that's come through on our questions today in respect to some of the challenges as well as the opportunities that this can bring in terms of how people look after their site or multiple sites which we got demonstrated by Jace today in terms of how Citrix have particularly used the software for their needs and benefits as an organization so at this point I want to say a massive uh, thank you to, to, to Ficada for, for supporting today's webinar to Luke to run through the interactivity i'm sure that session could have gone on for another hour as i've already said i think there was a lot to go through but i think seeing the live demos how it actually works resonates with a lot of people so thank you for that uh jace we're going through as i said citrix experience and how that's changed your world around security and matt obviously for going through the q a session for us today to, to bring a different voice onto the platform as well is always welcome but thank you to your dear self so thank you once again so I've just got a couple of slides, um, ladies and gentlemen, just to finish off. As we do on many of our episodes, just to remind people where today's episode will be stored with the previous 59 episodes. As I said, this was the 60th episode. This will be on our Insight Hub and that will be uploaded shortly. So please play back to colleagues, clients, staff that couldn't make today's episode. And as you wish, you can always watch it back yourself if you wish. Um, but on this Insight Hub, we have dedicated content hubs, research reports that go into the, the area around tech in particular um, and how that's changing the world of work place in FM and I think today's episode demonstrates how it's changing the world of security in particular. Good practice guides, guidance notes and as I say a lot more that can be found on the iwfm.org.uk insight page which is at the bottom there. So once again, thank you for today's panellists and for Carter, but most importantly as well, you listeners, viewers that have joined us today on today's live episode. As I say, thank you very much for the questions that come through. We promise to get 
uh, to the, the answers to your questions to the panelists and get back to you for the questions we couldn't go through today. Just to remind the audience, there is a short survey uh, as part of this episode, not just to rate this episode, but what future topics would you like to see? That drives our agenda, particularly what you've heard today. We've, we've touched upon a number of areas around security. Is there other aspects you want to see? For me, there could have been a whole debate about the skills needed. I know Jace talked about it, but actually, who is the individuals that are utilizing this software analytics is it, what skills are actually needed and I think Jace you touched upon it but maybe that's a episode to look at in the future but please fill in the short survey that is really important to us to drive our future programs as I say in future episodes as part of our series so please look out for today's episode it will be uploaded shortly next week's episode will be advertised on Friday so please look out for that and last but not least uh, take care keep safe and look forward to seeing you on future NTT episodes. Take care, everyone, and thank you again. Thank you.